Happy August 2nd, folks. It's good to see you here today. I hope you're having a blessed weekend. The last few weekends before school starts, if it starts at uh, going somewhere, so I hope you're, you're enjoying your weekend. And before we get started, if you're with someone, why don't you just kind of give them a high five who you're with on the couch or the cup table or at the uh, dining room table. If you're not, why don't you text someone right now and say, hey, how's your day going? Today we're going to start, uh, we're going to continue with uh, our filters. Pastor Greg started filters last week. This week we're going to talk about humility. And it's going to be kind of a hard topic for all of us because it's really kind of a hard topic in general to even to, to talk about, much less appreciate it's for us. But before we get going, I just want to remind you that today at uh, 11 o'clock, we're going to be holding a drive-by communion during the 1045 service. So after this worship service is over, around 11 o'clock, we're going to have you come to Bethel if you wish, if you feel comfortable. And Pastor Gray is going to be out there. He and an elder are going to be passing out what we do here in, in church, little communion cups, and you're going to get one and you can just drive right, right, right through. It's not going to be like the last one. This is going to be like the disposable ones we have. So it's coming here at 11 o'clock. It ends at 11.30. So again, we get everyone out of here by the time 1045 church service is over. We hope that you are comfortable uh, participating in that. If not, no big deal. But again, this is an opportunity for you to celebrate the gift of Jesus' presence in your life at this moment. So with that, I ask you to please join with me in a word of prayer. Um, Heavenly Father, you have repeatedly commanded your church to be a group of people who understand and appreciate that we who have failed in keeping your laws are to live humble lives, grace-filled but humble lives. I would humbly ask the next few moments of our life would be helpful, encouraging, maybe uh, confrontational, but at the same time, uh, your good news of your son Jesus, deal with that confrontation and lift us up to a place where we are comfortable being, striving, living through the life of humility. To the glory of your son's name I pray. Amen. Let's go to the Lord together in these words of confession. As human beings, it is hard and often thought unnecessary to be open with our struggles, failures, and sufferings. We have an innate propensity to hide them, rationalize them, ignore, or plead ignorance of them. 
and this is quite common in a church as well. We all are like sheep and have gone astray, for all of us sinned and fallen short of the glory of God, and now are reaping the results of what we have sown, permitted, remained silent in the presence of, acted upon, and lived according to our own ways. In our human nature, we're masters of self-deceit. So let us go before God and pray a simple prayer that will measure our ability to see our great need, our hunger for Jesus' gifts of forgiveness, our willingness to receive him and his grace, and our desire to live not with entitlement, but with humility before him and others. O Lord, have mercy on me, a sinner, for the sake of Jesus and he alone. Amen. And hear these words of forgiveness for you as well, that God in his grace and his mercy, in his unfailing love, has given his son to die for you, that Jesus, our Savior, would humble himself to the point of death on a cross for you and for me, so we may no longer be slaves to sin, but live to the glory of God. Your sins are forgiven. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen.
Humility has been encouraged by our Father, whether it be Jews, uh, Hebrews, or Christians, throughout the Word of God. He has encouraged His people to be a humble people, understanding that who they are in His kingdom is without Jesus and who they are with Jesus. It seems that uh, the Bible is pretty clear on it, but recently social scientists have been uh, getting in on the act saying we have found that the quality of relationships seem to be um, affected when someone's um, demand to be heard, demand for rights uh, to, be, to be expressed, diminish as those things elevate. And um, recently I was involved in a conversation, a conversation between two people who love each other a great deal. And uh, we were talking about two topics, uh, the baseball agreement that was made by the players and the owners and hashtag Black Lives Matter. The conversation on both topics was elevated to a point of hostility and anger where two people were trying to argue with each other and not listening to each other. And I reflect back on that conversation, I sometimes wonder if what's going on in our country these days, what's going on in our state these days, what's going on in our families these days, has to do with a lack of or a willingness to listen humbly to each other. So today we're going to talk about something that's kind of difficult. It's going to be uh, kind, of, uh, kind of harsh and brash. But at the same time, I hope it is very helpful for you as we continue to, to live and move at this time, whatever is going on right now. So with that, our first scripture reading this morning is from Romans chapter 12. For by the grace given to me, I say to everyone among you, not to think of himself more highly than he ought to think, but to think with sober judgment, each according to the measure of faith that God has assigned. For as in one body we have many members, and the members do not all have the same function, so we, though many, are one body in Christ, and individually members one of another, having gifts that differ according to the grace given to us. Let us use them. If prophecy in proportion to our faith, if service in our serving, the one who teaches in his teaching, the one who exhorts in his exhortation, the one who contributes in generosity, the one who leads with zeal, the one who does acts of mercy with cheerfulness. Amen. Our gospel lesson this morning is from Matthew chapter 14. Now when Jesus heard this, he withdrew from there in a boat to a desolate place by himself. But when the crowds heard it, they followed him on foot from the towns. When he went ashore, he saw a great crowd, and he had compassion on them and healed their sick. Now when it was evening, the disciples came to him and said, This is a desolate place, and the day is now over. Send the crowds away to go into the villages and buy food for themselves. But Jesus said, They need not go away. You give them something to eat. They said to him, We have only five loaves here and two fish. And he said, Bring them here to me. When he ordered the crowds to sit down on the grass, and taking the five loaves and the two fish, he looked up to heaven and said a blessing. Then he broke the loaves and gave them to the disciples, and the disciples gave them to the crowds. And they all ate and were satisfied. And they took up twelve basketfuls of the broken pieces left over. And those who ate were about 5,000 men, besides women and children. Amen. If I could do this easily, I would be sitting on a bench somewhere talking to you in a, in a way that's less formal. Uh, this particular filter is somewhat of a difficult one. It's not difficult to address, it's difficult to take to heart. If any of you have ever experienced a failure, I mean a big time failure, and have been restored by the person you failed. If any of you have ever um, received uh, and received back after you've hurt someone you've loved. I mean, if any of you have, um, have ever done something so painful to someone you love and they took you back as if nothing happened, you have experienced grace. You know what grace feels like. And the ability to receive grace and to enjoy grace comes with having been humbled. The key to appreciating God's grace is humility. To be graced 
filled Christ follower, you have to have humility. Um, for today, um, authentic, humble Christians, Christ followers, we need to know how deeply sinful we are and how loved we are beyond imagination. This is what breeds humility. And if you do not have both of those, you cannot be a faithful or a fruitful Christian. St. Augustine called humility uh, the Christian teaching. Thomas Aquinas says that humility is preeminent because once a person is humble, they can submit themselves to the grace of Christ. And Martin Luther, uh, the man who we're, our Lutheran church is named after, he said that humility alone saves because only then can you receive the grace of God in Jesus Christ. Today we have a few Bible verses that once again are found or peppered throughout the scripture. The first one comes from Psalm 25 verse 9. He guides the humble in what is right and teaches his way. From Luke 14 11, everyone who exalts himself will be humbled and he who humbles himself will be exalted. And today from Romans chapter 12 verse 3, for by the grace given me, I say to every one of you, do not think of yourself more highly than you ought, but rather think of yourself with sober judgment. Now the context of Romans chapter 12, as Pastor Grave talked about last week, um, was that the first 11 chapters of Romans, we hear all the doctrine of what's happening in the Christian church. And in chapter 12 on to 16, we have the practical side of Christianity. And four times in Paul's letters, Paul gives a list of spiritual gifts. And today in Romans chapter 12, what he does is he pre previews that spiritual gift list with these words again. For by the grace given to me, I say to every one of you, do not think of yourself more highly than you ought, but rather think of yourself with, or with sober judgment. And then Paul proceeds to instruct the believers on, on how to use their spiritual gifts. How God has given to them to be used for God's glory and for the benefit of other people. Romans chapter 12, 3 through 8, humility that flows from being forgiven, knowing that you're forgiven, comes to a point where you then want to go glorify God and give to your brothers and sisters in Christ the gifts that you've been given in Him. It is the filter in which we live out our days, humility. And this very important filter, um, it's also one of the most elusive filters in our time. It is, uh, in the United States today, I believe it is our biggest sin. The lack of humility. Thinking of ourselves more highly than we ought. And it seems to be especially true, uh, historically, for the Church of God in Jesus Christ, that is the Christian Church. How many of you have ever been turned off by an arrogant preacher who puts someone in their place? How many of you have, have been guilty of thinking of yourselves more highly than you ought as someone who's different than you, looks different than you, not as well educated as you are, not as well trained as you are, or thinks differently than you? The most committed sin, I believe, in America is not adultery. It's not prejudice. It's not hatred. It's a lack of humility that then creates the avenue from which all of these problems occur. Now, last week, Pastor Greg talked about how we are to be transformed, not conformed to this world, but transformed by the renewing of our mind to the Spirit of God living inside of us, and that we are to present ourselves as living sacrifices. Living sacrifices are hard. Um, the life of a Christian is hard. Coming to faith in Jesus is a gift of God. Being redeemed by Jesus is a gift of God. But the days afterward is hard. It's hard work. A living sacrifice is something that is ongoing. A dead sacrifice is easy. I mean, you bring it to the temple, you kill it, you burn it, it's over. It's done. But a living sacrifice is hard because it never ends. It's every day, every moment, every moment, even right now. We are to be deliberately, consciously, continually, perpetually offering ourselves to God. It's constant, we, it's never over, and it can be intense. And you add that together, I'm going to say something that's going to be probably offensive. And 
it's not to be offensive, it's meant to be instructive. I can't believe I'm saying this to uh, my fellow Americans, but I'm, I'm, I'm gonna do it this way. Folks, um, we cannot live the life of a disciple of Jesus unless we get away, maybe even put to death the idea or conform the idea that we can choose how we want to live in every aspect of our life. That our rights define our, our freedoms. That we can choose to do whatever we want, regardless of how it affects others. You see, there's never been a culture in humanity that we know of that is more adverse to living a life with the idea of living with humility than it is right now. We have become a group of people where it's centered on me and me and me and me. I mean, I love my country and I love the people of my country. But when I hear the demand for rights, the demand to be heard, the demand for this, I'm going to live my right, but I'm going to live this way and this is the way I want to live and I don't care how it affects others. I'm going to do this. I'm going to do what I want to do. I don't care how it affects others. I'm an American. I have the right to do this. I'm an American. Irregardless of how it affects others, I'm an American, and, and I, can, I, I, don't have, I can obey this rule, but I'm not going to obey this rule. I'm an American, therefore I'm going to do whatever I think is best, because in America, image is everything, I'm everything. Just look at Facebook, look at TikTok, look at Twitter. It's all focused on presenting me to the world. Have you recently heard how older people speak of younger people? Have you recently heard how Democrats speak of Republicans and Republicans speak of Democrats? I'm going to win and I'm going to do as much as I can to win, even if I have to bully you into submission. Humility is costly, it's costly in our jobs, costly in our community, it can be costly when you're dating, costly with your spouse. The thing, uh, the most thing, I would like you to, to think right now, the most humble person you know, and you want to push pause on this, go ahead, just think, who's the most humble person you have ever met in your life? For me, I've told you about this guy before, his name is Tom, he's been in Bethel a couple of times. Uh, Tom was a man who was quick to laugh at himself. Tom was a man who was quick to admit that he made a mistake. Tom was a man who typically positioned himself as a learner, not as a teacher. Tom was a guy who delighted in the success of other people. Tom was a guy who didn't pretend to have the knowledge or the ability that he lacked. He revealed his fears and his vulnerabilities to his friends in a very safe way. And he asked for directions when he needed help. Developing this filter is hard because this man, this man changed my life. He showed me a Christianity where it wasn't about being right and arguing someone into submission or proclaiming a word of God in a way that beat the tar out of the person I was listening. No, he showed me a savior, a Lord, a God, who did not consider equality with God something to be grasped, but humbled himself to the point of death on a cross. And that same God expects his followers to do the same thing. And I have, and I've, I, I, folks, I have done this, and I'm embarrassed to admit it, and I have seen Christians verbally and arrogantly trash somebody verbally, or trash a fellow Christian just to win an argument, or just to prove they're right, or just to put someone in their place, or just say that they're appropriate, or just to show them they made a mistake. You, can, you compare that to the Jesus who out of humble sacrifice showed us the way how to live with other people. This is hard. It's hard for me because I have uh, my own insecurities and my own pride. For instance, if I learn something, um, I have a tendency to act like I know everything then or I know everything about the subject. And the, and the Spirit usually comes along and humbles me by when I've 
made someone else feel stupid because I'm insecure. But developing this filter um, doesn't happen overnight. I met Tom in college. My, my kids are done with college. Um, the son who's, you know, he, he's getting an upper degree, but he's done with undergraduate studies. You wonder sometimes, what's wrong with you, Jeff? Why can't you get this down? I mean, you're good for a day or maybe an hour, and then you go right back to where you were for. Do not think of yourself more highly than you ought. Developing this filter, this attitude, this way of life, that takes a long time. Um, so today we're gonna to kind of compare it to uh, Shrek. I don't know if you guys remember Shrek, the movie. Um, in the movie, the first Shrek, uh, the Shrek's talking to the donkey, and he said, Ogre, I'm, ogres are, 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 are kind of like, they, have, they're, they're, they gotta be peeled back. They have, they're like onions, they have to be peeled back. The personalities have to be peeled back to reveal things of them. My personality and anyone who has original sin, our personality has to be peeled back like an onion, deeply and prolonged, so we can get our egos, our insecurities, our pride out, and we can learn to make daily choices that are filtered with humility. This doesn't happen overnight, and often you go right back to who you were before, but deliberate choice of making something that honors God versus that gets your way, it goes against our grain and sometimes against the many layers that we have. So humility is, is not a, a filter that we acquire uh, in a few moments. It's something that takes a long time, usually a lifetime. And even then, for some people, it's not enough. But it is a filter that is so precious to God. And I, I don't know how to say this more clearly, but it's this, it's this way. It's precious in the sight of God, who when the time is right, will exalt those who have been humbled forever. Humility can be a good friend. I mean, it can open you up to hunger for God. Because in doing so, you find out you need Him. It, it can empower you to trust Him with an open heart, because you know you trust Him. It, it inspires you to do things that you could never do if you don't trust someone else. We're told that God is far off from the proud, but those who have a contrite spirit, he dwells within. Humility is a sign of greatness in the kingdom of Jesus. So with that being said, here we go again. I need to know that I am sinful beyond my wildest imaginations. What does that look like? It means kids, if you have them, if you're blessed to have them, they're not going to turn out perfect. Part of it's your fault, part of it's their fault. Marriage, if you are blessed to be married, not blessed to be, or you're blessed not to be married, whatever, they're not going to be perfect. Sometimes it's your fault, sometimes it's their fault. Your spouse is never going to think and do the things just the way you want them to do, largely because you didn't marry your clone. Your daily work, the way you do things, are not always going to be understand. The way you think is not always going to be understand. And you're going to lose your patience because they don't understand you, even if they worked with you for years. You assume they're going to. And the list could go on and on and on until that time when you come to the recognition, I'm going to die. I have loved ones that are going to die. This hurts. This isn't fair. What's going on here? We're sinful beyond our wildest imaginations. I mean, it, 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 the list goes on and on and on. And the, more, and, and the more sinful that I thought I could be. And this is not a bunch of self-loathing or a bad, you know, bad self-esteem. Because self-loathing and bad self-esteem is also pride. Those people are fixated upon themselves when they have a low self-esteem or they're feeling bad about themselves. This is fixated upon them. It's still pride. That's not humility. But the second part of the statement is just as true as the first part. I am loved beyond all imagination. 
Now, the amazing thing about love is, <coughs> excuse me, no one has a right to be loved. If someone chooses to love you, far out. But when you come out of the, and come into this world, if your parents choose to love you, they love you. If they don't, they don't. You don't have that right to demand that. It's blessed when someone does love you, when someone gives you a sacrificial love that is beyond the imagination of anything. And your God has given you a love that you're not entitled to, but he chose to give, give to you. He chose to give it to you on a cross, through an empty tomb, through the waters of baptism, that he will live your life with you. Watching all the times that you were arrogant, all the times you were prideful, and so at the same time trying to transform you and to be that humble Christian servant that makes this world a better place. So my brothers and sisters, until we move on beyond what we're doing right now, we need to start appreciating what it means to be a saint, a forgiven sinner, both. And prayerfully, that will help us be more humble and live out our days making decisions that way to the glory of Jesus. Amen. Well, again, thank you, Pastor Jeff, for a great message and a great teaching and clarity on humility as a Christian, both the humility that we live with to choose to honor God and not just get our own way, but also the humility that God has shown us in Christ Jesus, uh, where we experience the very grace of God for every day of our life. And so we pray that uh, there was some good challenge for you, but also encouragement for you in that message today as you take that and live as his people. Uh, as we live as God's people, uh, we're also encouraged to, to give our tithes and offerings. And uh, so we just want to say thank you for all of the ways you continue to be generous in this time. Uh, it may be different. It may uh, look different, uh, but we are just grateful uh, for your generosity. And we pray as well that it is blessing you in your faith also, that um, in doing that, it's a way of saying, God, I trust you with everything, even the very things that I use to provide for myself or my family. God, I trust you. And in, in, in doing that uh, in a humble way, right, uh, but a confident way, uh, we pray it's a blessing to you also. On the screen, you're going to see a couple of different ways that you can continue to give here at Bethel. Uh, if you uh, need to know that information, you can also just find more information on our website and go there as well. So with that, I invite you to join me this morning as we proclaim our faith confidently together in the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, was suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sits at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Do you join me now in a time of prayer? Uh, gracious Heavenly Father, as we come before you today, uh, we do so as if standing on holy ground. We, we come before you humbly, but also confidently in Christ Jesus, our Savior. Lord, we seek the, the company of your grace for us and also for others that this may be a time when not only do we live by your grace, but we also live in sharing your grace with others in this time. Uh, and, and we pray that we might continue to hear and to obey the voice of your word and our Savior Jesus, and to live and to walk humbly as your servants and as your children in this life. And so humbly we come before you as well with these prayers on our hearts and our minds, and we lift them to you. Lord, we ask for your strength and for your healing and for your peace. Uh, we pray for Sarah Young, and uh, we pray that her upcoming surgery would go well, that all who attend to her, Lord, you would use their gifts uh, to make that surgery successful and give her peace of mind as that approaches. We pray that you would bring healing for uh, Adel Gossman and 
that she would remove the migraines and other pain that she might be experiencing. We pray also for Denise's dad uh, suffering a, a heart, heart attack, and we pray that you would bring healing and long-term recovery there as well. Father, for all those going through cancer treatments of any kinds or battling cancer in any form, uh, we pray that you would bring healing through those treatments. And so we lift to you Gary Nash and Sandy DeSuter, uh, Diane Faust and Kathy Grohl, for Liz, for Marsha Ware, Steve, and for, for Daryl. Lord, we just ask that you would continue to bring strength for them in their body, but also in their soul, that you might strengthen their faith and give them peace even in this time of affliction. We also ask for peace and uh, for strength for our missionaries who take your gospel around the world that speak of your grace and truth, the humility of Christ and the humility as we live as well. And so we pray for their protection, uh, but also uh, that their work may be uh, edifying and a blessing. We pray that you would bring protection, Lord, from the coronavirus, the flu, from other illnesses as well. And yet as people uh, do contract the virus, that uh, you would bring healing uh, readily and quickly. And yet also that you would drive us first to trust in you, to remind us first that our hope is in you, and then give you glory for any healing or treatment that does take place. Father, as the election time draws near, uh, we pray for our government leaders and for our nation. We pray that we might not be a divided people, but a united people. We pray, Lord, that as we may be passionate and have various viewpoints, we may still see each other as your created children, people for whom Christ died. May we see our government leaders this way as well. And so we pray for your wisdom and your discernment for them. Lord, we pray that if they don't know you as Lord and Savior, that you might open their hearts and their ears to, to hear and receive your gospel, that they may become followers of Jesus as well. We pray for them as they work out the, the difficulty of their vocations. And so we thank you for all that you do in providing for us through that process. Lord, we also are grateful for the safety that you provide for us, for those who are willing to put their life on the line for us, for those who are willing to um, give up many things so that we might be brought uh, health and safety and uh, provided with so many things. We pray for our men and women of military, uh, in the military. We pray for our police, for our firefighters, for our medical personnel. And we ask that you would grant them safety in their vocations, Lord, may you um, encourage them in those vocations, and might we support them as well. Lord, we pray that um, you would continue to give us all your wisdom and guidance and discernment, uh, especially here at our school as we look to open our school this school year, and we know there are many uncertainties still to come. So we pray for your protection, but we also pray for your wisdom, that we might fully rely on you and trust you, that you might give us grace with one another uh, and that you uh, might continue to guide us to the, the best ways forward. We pray for all who are traveling, that you would grant them your traveling mercies in this time. Uh, and we pray for the cool family as they travel, but also that you would bring them peace and comfort as they uh, travel uh, for the funeral of their nephew Bennett. We pray that you would restore them in this time of grieving and remind them that even in this time, they have hope in Jesus. So Lord, we're grateful as well that we can gather um, and grateful to still worship, whether it be online or in person. Grateful for your word that comes to us, your body and blood given and shed for us. And so we pray that you would send us forth this day and always humbly as your people and as your children to live this life as a living sacrifice, humbly and in the grace of Jesus Christ. And so these things we lift and commend to you in his name as together we pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done who, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses 
as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. And now receive the blessing of the Lord. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord look upon you with favor and give you his peace. Amen. Just a reminder for you today as well, uh, we will have drive-up communion from 11 to 11.30 a.m. here at church. You drive up into the parking lot, remain in your vehicle, and we'll serve communion to you there, just as we have done uh, one time previously as well. It's 11 to 11.30 this, this morning. If you'd like more information about that, you can find it through My Bethel or the uh, Bethel Blast from this week. God bless.